G'day guys, Mac with the Circle, and today, well, let's talk about the Horus Heresy again. Uh, this episode of Getting Started in Horus Heresy, I want to do a quick uh, catch up for people who obviously Betrayal at Calth and Burning Prospero boxes are no longer available. So I want to talk about easier ways to get into the hobby still, uh, as well as the next steps, which I've approached before, and I want to elaborate more on some little bits and pieces because I get asked a lot of the same questions constantly. Which, hey, I don't mind, ask away with the questions, but if I can provide an answer here that can help people, well, that'd be pretty beneficial, wouldn't it? So, I'm going to answer that question here, and I'll explain what it is later. So, first of all, Horus Heresy kits are still available from Games Workshop. Oh, Cataphractia currently sold out, but they'll come back. Uh, I don't recommend the Plastic Dreadnought, that's why I'm not showing it. Now, if you want to go to Games Workshop, you can. If you want to go to a third-party retailer and get 20% to 30% off, you can. If you want to go on eBay, you can. These models are still out there. Will they be as cheap as Betrayal at Kelth and Burning of Prospero? No. Very, very unlikely that they will be. However, it does still happen. Kits that are out of production can be cheap. Constantly, these things pop up in buy, swap, and sell pages ready for people to buy because they maybe got into Horus Heresy, didn't like it, or maybe they bought them for another project, they're trying to get rid of them. In any case, you can get these miniatures still. Now, this is for a marine army, of course, um, but it applies to everyone. It is actually not that expensive a hobby to get into. Don't be fooled by the fact that, okay, Forge World seems more expensive on the outside. I mean, I guess it is now with some of the price rises that have happened in the last year or so. But when you look at it, Games Workshop games now for, say, 40k Age of Sigma are more expensive than ever for less models than ever. And it's sort of a trick on you because you think, well, you know, I used to need, say, 70 models for an army. Now I only need 50 models for the army. But the thing is, look at the cost Let's say I'll go into the Warhammer 40k section now. So, we'll go into Space Marines. What is the cost of a 10-man Primaris Infiltrator Squad? $98. Alright. Let's keep looking. Primaris Hellblasters, $98. Marine Scouts, $41. Here we go, Tactical Squad. Here's what I want. So $65 for a Tactical Squad. Australian, of course. Uh, prices will be different in other territories. So $65 for 10 fully posable, multi-part plastic space marines that you can build in any way you like. As opposed to the Primaris Hellbasters, for example, which I'm pretty sure have certain ways of going together. I'm going to check the sprue out now, because I'm not super familiar with them. Okay, so leg to leg, that sort of thing. Yep. Guess they're only showing one sprue. What's the second one? Yep, so the legs definitely born with a certain torso, and yeah. So, Nowhere near as monopo, uh, sorry, nowhere near as uh, customizable as the Tactical Squad, and thirty three dollars more. So keep that in mind. Forty k really not that much cheaper a game because well you need less models but you're paying a lot more for the models. Primaris Repulsor Executioner one hundred and sixty five dollars. I mean a Storm Raven Gunship or a Land Raider are both only one hundred ten dollars. Drop pod's only 55. Neither of these units could, of course, be used by Primaris Space Marines. Uh, what about their Dreadnoughts? $110. If I go on the Forge World Web Store, I can buy a Leviathan Dreadnought for $110. So, uh, granted, it doesn't come with the arms, but I do get to pick what weapons it does come with and buy those separately and magnetize them and do whatever I like with said Dreadnought. And I can pose them in any way I like. So, you know, bonuses. So don't fall into the misconception, guys, that you can't get into the Horus Heresy. It is 
just as cheap to get into. By the time you have three or four tactical squads and a HQ element, a unit of tanks and some other special unit, you've got well over a thousand points, maybe even 1500 by that point, maybe even more than 1500. And you're paid the same as getting into 40k. The only difference is of course that it's a very different game to 40k. So just a little PSA at the start there. Now, looking over at Forge World and Horus Heresy, let's talk about those next steps because a lot of people ask me all the time because they go, oh Maka, you do really well at competitions and events and you, you make it seem so effortless, you know, you clearly know something about what you're doing. And thank you for a start. Um, but the common question is, where do I go next with my force? And I've done a video before talking about this. Now, I have a simple philosophy when it comes to build, list building, which I want to share here today, and I think I've shared it before, but again, never hurts to reiterate. Every unit needs to be able to fulfill multiple roles on my battlefield. Because if I have an army and I'm like, this is the anti-tank unit, this is the anti-infantry unit, and that unit dies, and I don't have anything to back it up, I'm fucked. So I always make sure that a unit can, to some degree, perform a secondary function that overlaps with another unit's primary function. So if you're sitting there and you're like, I have an army now and it's building up in points and um, I'm starting to fill it out, I've got lots of infantry and I'm going to add some artillery to it and I'm putting in Vindicators, I'm putting in Medusas, I'm putting in uh, Quad Mortars, I'll then say, why are you putting in things that all do the same job? Because you've got no redundancy there. You see what I'm saying here, guys? Uh, I had this chat just the other night with a good friend of mine, Dom. We are talking about his World Eaters and how he feels he really was lacking the scoring. And I said, well, you're running very large units of tactical marines, like squads of 20. You cut it down to 15. You're not really going to notice much of a drop in their fighting capabilities, especially considering they're vehicle-borne. So they're not going to lose too many troops before making their initial charges. And frankly, the difference between 20 World Eaters, tactical marines with close combat weapons, assaulting you at 15 is negligible. Either way, it's a blender hitting you right in the testicles. Why don't you use some of those saved points to buy another tactical squad? You don't have to do anything special with it. You don't have to upgrade the sergeants or anything like that. But for 150 points, you can have a 10-man scoring unit that the enemy may have to deal with. And it gives you extra bodies on the battlefield that you can send in a different direction to your big tactical squads. Then we look at something like the Vindicators, it's like Vindicators are terrifying if you're a Custode player or maybe you've got Terminators. Me though, I'm White Scars, I've got jet bikes. You hit a squad of my jet bikes with a Vindicator, or will it for a start. Probably half my bikes or more are going to survive. It seems to play out that way every time. A squad of three will usually lose one. And that's the potential, is three wounds for a Vindicator shell. And you spend 120 points on it and I'm going to melt them all to death, guarantee the next turn. I then look at something, I say, well, you know, if instead of a Vindicator, if you'd hit that squad with something like, I don't know, a, a Sigran Punisher is a great example. That's the uh, Sigran variant, of course, this bad boy right here, which I'll, uh, of course, open up on screen right now for those who are actually watching the video, not listening. Uh, it's got a massive minigun on top, and you can give it a couple of heavy bolter sponsons as well. So you're talking... Uh, I think, I think it's 20 shots for the main gun and then additional 9 from the heavy bolters. And if you put one on the pintle, you can also get that up to 12. So you, you've got a pretty much guaranteed 32 strength 5 shots. So you're pumping out about 30 inches range on a platform that can move 12 inches. Well, on a three-man bike squad, roughly every six saves you have to make, you're going to fail one. Well, that's pretty bad news for you if you've got to make over 30 saves, because chances are that's up to five bikes can die from one of these. Now, that, in my opinion, is a good side uh, purchase to make next to a Vindicator, because they have two completely separate jobs. One makes you take a fucking shitload of saves. The other one just makes sure that what it hits will 
terribly suffer if a wound does get through. And they're two very different focuses. And just adding more, say, Vindicators, more Quad Mortars, that sort of thing to your force, is not making it better. Now, you may have thematic reasons, fluff reasons, that kind of thing. If that's your reason, don't worry about what I'm saying right now. You do whatever you like if you think it's fun for you and is doing a theme. Okay? But if you want to be in any way, I won't say competitive, but a viable list building where you're not just going to get stomped by the other player for rocking up. And it does happen. <laughs> it really does happen. Uh, World Eaters players, for example, who just take bulk tactical marines and just try and run them across the battlefield, yeah, they always have a bad time. You know? So, pick things which can do different jobs to one another, but also cover each other's jobs. It's very, very important, guys, when you're building a force up. This is why units like the Sikoran Arcus are so important. Why is the Sikoran Arcus so important? Because it can kill air units, Mechanicum units, it can kill infantry, it has Strength 8 AP2 weapons with decent range. It's a fast vehicle platform, it has Armor 13, it's like a holy trinity of things. It's got the speed, the firepower, the mobility, it is true tank design right there. Those are, by the way, the three core tenets of real tank design. Uh, the core tenets for infantry weapon design, funny enough, are increased lethality, increased accuracy, and decreased weight. True story. Anyway, something like a Sikoran Arcus is able to do a whole bunch of rolls, especially when you don't move it and you shoot twice at the thing. Uh, yeah, terrifying, right? So, something for people to keep in mind there is something that can perform multiple rolls is inevitably more valuable, and that's why you'll see something like the Sikoran Arcus in so many more games. But of course, to go along with this, being so good at so many roles, it becomes target priority number one. So, if you lose the Arcus, what have you got to back it up in your corner? It's also the reason why something like, say, the Sikoran Omega, that's this uh, lovely plasma cannon armed Sikoran tank, is not taken by people. It's worse than the Arcus, it's worse than the regular Sikara in a lot of ways, it's worse than a Plasma Derrida, it's worse than a tactical support score with Plasma Derrida, it's basically just shit. So no one takes it. It's the same reason why you don't see too many Predators going around. Predators are not a bad choice for you to take in games of Horus Heresy, but you gotta know what you're doing with them. What do I mean by this? Well, you can't just take three Predators with auto cannons and heavy bolters and go, oh well, it's a lot of Daka, you know, uh, they'll get some wounds. Because I'll go, okay, what other job are they fulfilling beyond just putting out a lot of bullets? They don't have the speed of something like the uh, Sikoran Punisher. Okay, so they're nowhere near as mobile. They're a squadron, so damage that happens to one vehicle can roll over onto another. That's bad for you. Uh, all they bring to the table is the ability to kill other white armor and whitely armored infantry. Uh, not great. So if I'm going to use something like these Predator battle tanks, I need to have a reason. Now, a reason might be, hey, I can use them as movable cover for my infantry. When I start deployment at the start of the game, I'll have three of these guys in front of my infantry forming uh, a wall that the enemy can't see through to shoot at more valuable units. Okay, now you're coming up with a use for these vehicles. That is something really handy to do. If someone says, oh, well, you know, I really like the Sikoran Venator. Again, I'm just picking units off the screen to give examples. I think it's got really good tank killing potential. And I'll say, okay, that's true. What are you going to arm it with? Now, obviously, it's going to come with a neutron laser. And then they'll go, las cannons. And then I will say, why are you giving it las cannons? It's an ordnance weapon. It can only fire the main gun at normal ballistic skill. The rest of them have to snap fire. You're wasting your points on the las cannons, unless the neutron laser goes down, in which case, the neutron laser went down, and you've got other troubles already with this vehicle. Instead, I always suggest just take the heavy bolter options for your support weapons on it. That will give it some sort of anti-infantry firepower if you need it, and you may just need it. Alright, the Vindicator Squadron was another great one. 
I said to a person, you know, you're running two Vindicators in a squadron, you're giving them both power of the Machine Spirit. Why? What is the utility you're getting out of that? You can still move and fire with Ordnance Weapons in Heresy. And thus, the Machine Spirit allows you to split fire. Well, you only need it on one vehicle then to split fire. Just put it on the one you want to shoot at something else. You're giving it to them both, you know, it's 20 points you can save and spend elsewhere. Something like... Uh, Legion Javelin attacks me with a cannon. I will get a person say that is the worst choice out of the two. Why would you take that? Uh, the Legion Javelin with missile launchers is far superior because it's got more firepower. The firepower is twin linked. Yeah, okay, it's not going to crush tanks, that sort of thing. But frankly, las cannons don't crush tanks except in decent numbers in Heresy because, well, flare shields are a thing. Armor 14 is commonplace. I'd rather have. Uh, javelins with missiles, and I do. I have two of them in my white scars and three Kizagan land speeders. It's amazing, by the way. By using these crack missiles and firing them at infantry, I dramatically improve the killing chances on the vehicle. Instead of just eviscerating two infantry with my las cannons for many more points, I go with the missiles and I can obliterate way more infantry. And if I fight something like militia, I can go for the frag mode. And again, it's twin linked. It's just better. Okay. Then we look at something like, uh, I don't know, Outriders. If you're using Outriders, why is your, what's your reason for this? What do they have to offer you that the dick bikes, the jet bikes, don't? Because Outriders are almost as expensive in points, have worse armor saves, worse mobility, and worse firepower. And if you upgrade them to have something like Plasma, twin linked plasma guns, well, frankly, jet bikes can, are now cheaper, or they can upgrade to plasma cannons, which are just way better. Okay, now moving on. Different types of Praetors and consoles, actually. That's a great little side note there. So, it's one thing to go, I want killing power, and take something like a champion, a Praetor, Delegatus, these sort of units, uh, chaplains. How do you integrate it into your force? If you just have a character attached to, say, a standard tactical squad, and it's just walking across the battlefield, it's going to draw firepower. So you need to think, where are you going to put this unit to be effective? Is it effective in this force? Maybe it's not. Maybe there are better units you can choose. Because taking something, apart from for the rule of cool, just because you want to, is never a good idea, in my opinion. This applies to any faction. So right now, of course, we're looking at the Legion as the Stardis, but I'm an equal opportunities player, so let's go look at something like, say, the Mechanicum. All right. So, Mechanicum units. You've got something like a giant Magos, like an Acrius Scoria, or perhaps you have the uh, Archmagos Dracovic model here that has this giant um, abeyant that he rides around in. Do you need the giant abeyant? If you do, why? What are you taking it for? What is it achieving? Same thing with the other units, like Myrmidons, things like that. Okay, they're great. They have a lot of firepower. They're pretty tough, but what are you buying for them? What weapons are you equipping them with? Where are you planning to use them? What are they adding to your army? These are all things you have to take into consideration. Castellax are another great one. If you're taking a Castellax and they're just a couple of big bodies to soak up wounds, maybe just more pattern bolt cannons like the one on the left here is a better choice. If you take, say, the Darkfire Cannon or the Multi Melter and Power Blades, you're paying a lot of extra points for something that you don't intend on using either of those items. So it is not a smart idea. Same with something like uh, the Thalax. The Thalax have a lot of weapon options available to them, but if you choose the wrong one and you don't capitalize upon its strengths, you're wasting the Thalax. And this can be said for any faction. I'm just picking Mechanicum right now because I can. Uh, these delivery platforms, Subterranean Assault Group, well, okay, you could buy a whole bunch of termites, but what are you going to put in them? If you have an army composed primarily of lots of Thalax, for example, you're wasting it. If you are planning on putting, say, 
Sekitari Hopwites in it or Peltists, okay, yeah, you might be onto something because those are the sort of units you want to get into the enemy deployment zone up close in your face, that sort of thing. What about some other factions? I'll move around really quickly through a couple of them. Legio Custode, there's a good one. So, Custodes bring a lot to the table. But again, you've got to decide, do you need Constantin well and heavily over-designed uh, Valdor? Probably not, because nine times out of ten, unless you face something like a Primark, um, you'd just be better served by just a regular shield captain. And if you do face a Primark, well, Veldor, Veldor, yeah, you could probably take someone like maybe Elfarius in a fight, maybe. Um, but it's just better to avoid the fight. Or send some chaff units in to tie them up and use your character to fight elsewhere on the battlefield. So if you're taking Veldor, oh, I'm going to fight Primarchs, so I better take him. You're doing it for the wrong reasons, guys. Um, same thing with things like the Dreadnoughts. Oh yeah, I have a Telamon Dreadnought and I'm going to give it a fist and a shooting weapon. And again, people love doing this. They love taking a Dreadnought with a fist and a shooting weapon. They say, well, you know, it allows me to do a bit of both jobs. And I go, yeah, my problem with that is you don't do either job anywhere near as well as you could if you dedicated yourself to the role. Now, there's a lot to be said for flexibility and versatility in real life. However, in the game, it really just... <laughs> you will always be well looked after in any game of 30k if you go for the firepower option. If you go for a Talmon with two gun arms, it's going to serve you really well no matter what. If you go for a Talmon with two fist arms, you really need to alter your style of gameplay. And then you need to think to yourself, I've now gone for a unit which brings a lot of close combat fire, uh, killing potential. I've now lost a whole bunch of ranged potential, so I need to even that out another way. Unless you're going to go all in for the, I'm going to get into close combat with you. And I'm a White Scars player. And if I see someone come at me with a Telmon Dreadnought on foot and a bunch of Custode with Guardian Spears on foot, I'm going to laugh and do a 30-inch turbo boost move straight over their heads and they're never going to catch me. So I'm the sort of player you've got to think about. I think a Raven Guard player could do that too. Uh, mate here, Kieran, has a lovely Alpha Legion list. It has a lot of Dread Cores in it. Those things will just fly in circles around you all day, and there's nothing you'll be able to do about it. The only thing you can do is hope for it being an objectives game and try and get as many custody units as you can onto objectives. And that's pretty much all you can do. So, again, you can't focus on any one area, but if you are going to do something like that with the Dreadnought, I'd suggest going for the firepower options over the close combat options. So, hopefully I've given some sort of... Uh, advice here today that people can take on board and that is think about what the role of something is within your army and what it's providing you and why it's providing it to you if you can't answer those questions in any decisive or meaningful way then you need to possibly rethink the option and again i have to stress this if you chose it because you just like it and you don't care how it performs that's a completely different story because in that case, do whatever the hell you want with your army. Pick any unit, any type, whatever. Go for it. I'm not going to hold it against anyone. I, I highly encourage it, in fact. And I often do take things as well, just for the rule of cool. But if you're trying to make a list and you're like, look, I don't know what to buy next. I mean, people who go, I don't know what to buy next, are wanting a list that is capable of fighting other lists on an even footing. That's what it comes down to. They wouldn't be asking me the question. So when they do ask me that question... This is what I have to say to them. Pick things that complement what you've already got and don't completely overlap with something else. So if you're picking a Vindicator, for example, don't go loading up on Whirlwinds, Basilisks, and Quad Mortars at the same time because they're all doing the same bloody job. They're all dropping pie plates. And they're only doing the job of dropping pie plates. So you'd want to mix it up and do something different. Hey, Here's a Vindicator. Here's a Laser Destroyer that's really good at killing armor. Similar but different. Those are options available to you. Anyway, I'm back with the Outer Circle. Hope you found this helpful in some capacity. And I'll see you all next time.